Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the National Center for Rural Road Safety's May webinar entitled Motorcycle Safety. I'm going to close out our polls and get us started here. It does look like we have about 42% of you from the Midwest today, about 28% from the Southeast, about 10% from the Northeast, 16% from Western US, and about 7% other. As far as how you guys are all joining us today, most of you, about 70%, are joining us by computer only. Um, the rest of you are joining us from both. We also, as far as who's joining us from what organizations today, we have about 37% from state DOT, about 12% from local transportation departments, 9% from state highway safety offices. We have about 6% from other federal agencies, 3% um, from law enforcement and EMS, about 12% from educational institutions, and 15% from private consultants. And it looks like the good majority of you, about 85%, are um, visiting us on your own. But as always, we do have a few of you that are following us in groups today as well. I'm going to move us over quickly to our webinar and provide you guys with a few logistics for today's webinar. So today's webinar will be an hour and a half long. It is being recorded, as always, and will be available archived on our website by the end of the week. For quality of our recording, we have muted everyone's phone lines during the presentation. Um, because of this, if you are listening by phone, we would ask if you could please mute your computer speakers, otherwise you may hear some feedback. If you do have any issues with the audio for today's webinar and you're listening by Wi-Fi only, or through your computer audio speakers. If you wouldn't mind, please call in if you do have any of that, um, any of those technical difficulties. The phone number can be found in the top left-hand corner of your screen. Um, you may also use the chat pod at any time and uh, reach out to Dana, who is one of the WTI staff members who does help with our technical issues as well. If you would like to maximize your presentation so that you see only the PowerPoint, full screen. You can do that by um, pressing the four arrow keys that are in the top right hand corner of your screen and that will again make your PowerPoint full size. At the end of each of our sections today, uh, there will be four of them. We will have time for question and answers. Um, because you are muted, you are welcome to put your questions into the chat pod at any time. When we do stop for those question and answer sections, I will read them out one by one to our presenters. I also want to direct your attention to the bottom left-hand corner of the screen uh, where there is a handout pod. You'll find that there are a few handouts in here um, that our last presenter has put in about the Safe Rider program. There is also a PDF version of today's PowerPoint slides, and there is a handout which provides you with um, one quick look at all of the resources and links that will be provided in today's um, webinar as well. So those are available for download at any time during today's um, presentation. I also want to mention, um, as always, we do have our follow-up surveys uh, that are vital for us to assessing our webinars um, and also to receiving your certificates and CEUs. All previous month's certificates and CEUs have been created and will be emailed out this afternoon. So if you have not received them by tomorrow, you can contact me um, and we'll make sure that you get those. The survey link for today's webinar you can find um, on your screen right now. Again, that's also available in the handouts uh, section in the, the PDF version of today's webinar PowerPoint, as well as it will be emailed to you directly following today's webinar. Um, if you do not receive it in your inbox, we would just ask if you could please check your junk mail because they do tend to um, end up in junk mail. The survey closes two weeks after the webinar, and you can generally expect certificates and CEUs about four to six weeks after the webinar. Um, we do hand make all of the certificates and hand email them out, so it does take us a little while sometimes. The CEU forms that you will be sent can be filled out and returned to continuing ed at montana.edu and not to the safety center. Those are run through a different part of Montana State University. Um, however, those CEUs are provided to you for free by the safety center. 
You may also request a verification of completion form. You can see that right now in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, when you do request that from Continuing Education at Montana State University, it will tell you all of the uh, all of the webinars or summits that you have attended that were safety centers um, that you have requested CEUs for, and this will be one easy way for you to uh, have all of that information in, in one place. For today, we do have three presenters. Uh, the first presenter is, is myself. My name is Jamie Sullivan, and I am the center manager for the National Center for Railroad Safety. I am also a research engineer for the Western Transportation Institute, and I do focus on safety and operations research, as well as research on parks and public lands. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from UMass Amherst, and a master's degree in transportation engineering from Texas A&M University. Next, we'll have Cliff Ryer, who is from South Dakota LTAP. He is a technical assistance provider for South Dakota LTAP at the South Dakota State University. Cliff spent 40 years with South Dakota DOT and worked in construction inspection, billboard junkyard control, as a maintenance analyst, a region traffic operations, and for the last 15 years of his career with the South Dakota DOT in the Traffic and Safety Engineering Department, retiring in 2009. And finally, we will have Brian Medeiros, who is an Oklahoma State Trooper for the past 24 years. He is also an OHP motorcycle officer for 18 years. And he, is, he went to Northwestern University um, to become a trained police motor, motorcycle instructor for the last 14 years as well. So we are thankful to have um, both Cliff and Brian with us today to speak to you guys about motorcycle safety. The goal for this webinar is that once you've completed it, you will understand the safety needs, challenges, and countermeasures for both riders and for drivers. And to do so, we have a few learning outcomes for you. First, we'll summarize motorcycle safety, safety statistics. Then you should be able to demonstrate an understanding of motorcycle safety challenges. You'll be able to identify countermeasures to improve motorcycle safety, to restate the resources available for motorcycle safety, to identify best practices in South Dakota, and to describe the benefits of the Oklahoma Safe Riders Program. So to get started, I did want to let you guys know why we picked this particular topic. So um, May is Motorcycle Safety Awareness Month, so we did feel like it was a topic that, as part of the Safety Center, we have not yet addressed. Um, we have done several newsletter articles, several um, blog articles about motorcycle safety, but in our 40-some-odd in our um, webinars that we've done monthly over the last three and a half years, uh, motorcycle safety was not one of the ones that we have yet addressed. So we did want to make sure that we did that um, and get this information archived and make sure everyone knows where all of the resources are. So I am going to start, start out today's presentation by um, talking about some of the statistics so that we can get up to speed on motorcycles um, as this NHTSA logo does show. All of the information that I'm going to talk to you about is from either um, NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, or from GHSA, which is the Governor's Highway Safety Association. And I will um, provide all of the links to where you can find these statistics on your own afterwards. Um, you may also find all of these infographics that you're seeing on the slides as well. They are downloadable and available from um, the NHTSA website. So first, I wanted to talk about uh, fatalities for motorcyclists. So there, in 2016, there were over 5,200 motorcycle fatalities. Um, and showing on this infographic is that as of 2017, the estimate was a little under 5,000. But those numbers have been updated a bit since this infographic was created. And now it is a little over 5,000 as well. So the decrease from 2016 to 2017 that they're estimating before they do have final numbers now is about 3% decrease. Um, of those motorcyclists killed in 2016, 94% of those were riders, and 6% were their passengers. So for this, we, we see that um, motorcyclists now represent approximately 14% of all motor vehicle-related fatalities which is up 5.7% um, 5, 5 since 1994. Um, 
Age is a big factor in this as well. 54% of motorcyclists killed in 2016 were 40 and older, and the average age for motorcyclist fatalities is 43. Um, in a 10-year period that they were looking at from 2007 to 2016, uh, this has increased about 12%. So what we know is that motorcycle fatalities are overrepresented in traffic fatalities themselves. Um, per miles driven, motorcycles have a fatality rate that is 28 times higher than that of passenger vehicles. So this is a, a startling statistic. Um, and when we begin talking about the road to zero and vision zero and wanting to really get to that number of zero, we want to make sure that, um, that we do address motorcycle safety as well. So for talking about the different types of motorcycle crashes as well as behavioral impacts uh, for motorcycle crashes, you can see that about 57% of the crashes occur in urban areas as opposed to about 43% in rural areas. When we talk about the location of these crashes, about 34% of them are occurring in intersections and at 66% in non-intersections. You can also look at weather and about 97% of these fatalities are, are occurring in clear and um, cloudy weather as opposed to some of the weather conditions that we think about like rain or snow. Also as far as light conditions go, you might be surprised to see that 59% of these crashes are occurring in daylight versus the 36% in darkness. We can also look at the type of roadway functional class that these um, fatalities are occurring on as well. And the largest percentage, 32%, is happening on non-interstate principal arterials. As far as behavioral effects of motorcycle statistics go, about 37% of motorcycle riders who died in a single vehicle crash um, in 2016 were alcohol impaired. So this is a huge part as well. Um, Another piece is the speeding effects. 33% of all motorcycle riders involved in fatal crashes were speeding. And that, when you compare it to passenger car drivers at 19%, light truck drivers at 15%, and large truck drivers at 7%, um, that, is, that is, again, a, a pretty startling number that 33% of all motorcycle riders involved in a fatal crash was, were speeding. This, what does this add up to for us? It's about $12.8 billion annual economic costs due to motorcycle injuries and fatalities. And again, when we talk about the road to zero and vision zero that we talk about a lot through the National Center um, for Rural Road Safety, every one of those fatalities has a name and a face, and we want to make sure that they get home at the, the end of the night to their family. One of the things that can help with that is um, enforcement and laws that exist. Uh, one of those is helmets. So helmets actually saved um, 1,800 motorcyclist lives in 2016, and it's estimated that about 800 more lives could have been saved if, motor if those motorcyclists had been wearing helmets. So when we start talking about these statistics and and the numbers that are out there, what are some of the things that we can do? And what are some of the challenges for doing this? Um, the graphic that you're seeing on the right-hand side of your screen right now is one of the posters that is downloadable and available through NHTSA. Um, if you look at that, it took me quite a while to figure it out, too. Um, but if you can spot that motorcyclist, um, again, this is an urban area, so it's a little bit different from what we're looking at in rural areas. But in a rural area, when you see um, all of the curves, and you're looking to your right or your left to see if you can find a motorcyclist, they do come up on you quite fast as well. So making sure the visibility of, of a motorcycle um, is very important. So some of these challenges, um, as a person who rides on the back of a motorcycle, I know that it is a, it's a lot of fun to be out in the open air and driving and being able to see the sights and be able to feel the cool breeze as you go past the lakes and the air changes. Um, but it also makes you very vulnerable. There's a lack of external protection. There's no, you don't have the steel cages and the crumple zones that you would have in a car. Um, you're exposed far more than, than when you're in a passenger car. And a small dent during an accident or a crash um, for a vehicle can actually end up as a fatality for a motorist. It's very different. Um, 
Some of the other reasons for this are the lack of seat belts and the lack of airbags. Uh, riders can be thrown in, the cr in a crash. Um, there's the instability of being on a two-wheeled vehicle. Acceleration and speed capabilities of the motorcycles. Um, it is easier to, to start and stop much quicker on a motorcycle than in a passenger vehicle. Um, as we just talked about, the size of the vehicle makes it harder to see visibly, and it also makes it easier to end up in a passenger vehicle's um, blind spot. There's also a lot more hazards that you have to consider, such as the weather, weather hazards with rain and snow, uh, and conditions such as poor pavement, gravel roads, um, and even some of the sand and debris that gets pushed into the roadway. And those types of things end up reducing the control that a motorcyclist may have. Some of the safety challenges with motorcycle riding practices as well that we need to make sure um, are known by a motorist in a passenger vehicle would be the downshifting. Many times when you're looking at a passenger vehicle and wondering if they're slowing down or stopping, you're looking for brake lights. And that is not necessarily the case with a motorcycle. Uh, brake lights are very small and hard to see in the first place, but also not necessarily always used due to downshifting. And again, I just mentioned the, the weaving that can occur as well. A um, motorcycle is much smaller than a passenger vehicle, so it tracks in a lane very differently. Um, motorists sometimes, or passenger vehicles sometimes forget that a motorcycle can take up and has the right to that entire lane. Um, but they are able to also weave through that lane and change their positions based on um, potholes or debris that they may find and again end up in the blind spot of a vehicle. So at this point, I am going to stop and see if there are any questions. Um, again, you can put those questions in the chat pod over on the left-hand side. Um, I am also going to move us to a poll break and ask you guys a few questions based on the information that I just provided. So the first question we have for you is, which of the following is false? In 2016, motorcyclists had a fatality rate 28 times higher than passenger vehicles. Helmet saved over 18,856 um, 18, lives. 70% of motorcycle fatalities occurred in rural areas. The average age of a motorcycle rider killed was 43. And 33% of all motorcycle riders involved in fatal crashes were speeding. And the last option is I don't know or I don't remember. And then the second question is to name a motorcycle safety challenge. Um, and again, you can tell me one of the ones that we mentioned, or if you know of any that I did not mention and would like to put those in, that would be great as well. So some of the ones coming in so far are visibility to motorists, uh, lack of visibility, being seen, and no seat belts. Um, a couple other ones that are coming in, being rear-ended in a queue um, and pinned between vehicles in states that don't allow filtering, a lack of understanding of a motorcycle, of motorcycle laws by car drivers, uh, sharing road, lane splitting and lane sharing, uh, which does occur a lot, um, being rear-ended in a queue and pinned between vehicles, oh, sorry, and I read that one already, uh, small size where it seems far away, uh, no protection, distracted drivers is a huge one nowadays as well, uh, riding in blind spots, drinking and riding, driver's perception of motorcycles, not wearing all the gear all the time, that is correct as well. Uh, road debris, lack of protection, lack of visibility. Okay, and I'm going to close out this other one and provide you with the results of this one, too. So it looks like the majority of you, about 64%, did get this one right. So the one that was false was 70% of motorcycle fatalities occurred in rural areas. Um, the 
answer was actually 43% occur in rural areas. So while typical motorcycle traffic fatalities are about 50-50 um, between rural and urban for a motorcyclist fatality, uh, the urban-rural split is 57% urban and 43% rural. So I didn't want to spend um, a ton of time on the statistics and the same thing on this next part with the countermeasures and the resources. I do want to give you guys an a overview, a very brief overview of what does exist um, and all of the links so that you can go back and, and look through these um, resources yourself. But I did want to leave most of the time for our two speakers. Um, we will be having Cliff speak to us about some of the engineering countermeasures um, and also public awareness countermeasures that they have put into place for um, Sturgis Motorcycle Rally. I know not every one state is going to have an event as big as Sturgis, but there are a lot of lessons learned and things that you can take out of his presentation um, and use in your own state. And then I'm excited to also have um, a Trooper Medeiros here from the Oklahoma Safe Riders Program so he can explain the safe rider training that they provide to their motorcycle riders as well. And they do this as a free program um, in conjunction with their Department of Transportation. So to provide you with a few of these resources that are available, one of the first countermeasures that we can do, um, as we always talk about the four E's, engineering, education, enforcement, and emergency services, um, some of the first ones are in engineering. So Federal Highway Administration's proven safety countermeasures, um, I provided the link for those there. They do have several safety countermeasures that can be used to help with motorcycle safety. Um, and I know Cliff will be speaking about several of these, including high friction surface treatment. Uh, one of the other ones is road safety audits. And there have been some road safety audits done for motorcycles. And there is a document um, that shows all the case studies on motorcycle road safety audits. So I did want to make sure that you knew that that resource existed. For enforcement, NHTSA has recently released um, a five-year plan. And this plan talks a lot about many different things, including a lot of the statistics that I just went over with you. It also includes information on how to, how to plan for motorcycle safety using a data-driven uh, program, which most of us have been doing in the um, transportation safety world for other types of safety. Um, using systemic safety. So now they're talking about that in the, in the frame of motorcycle safety as well. They also talk a lot about law enforcement and the different types of enforcement that can be done, such as um, laws, such as licensing, uh, helmets, as we talked about earlier, the age requirements in different states, um, insurance requirements as well for motorcycles, and then how to set up checkpoints for riding sober. So this five-year plan is a great resource. And again, it's a brand new resource that was just released um, earlier this month. So I'd highly recommend checking that one out. One of the other pieces that I wanted to mention to you as well uh, for countermeasures to improve safety is education. And this revolves both around motor, uh, motorist awareness of motorcycles as well as rider safety. Um, for, the motorcycle, for the motorist awareness, um, you have graphics such as this one showing on the screen. Again, this is one that is available through NHTSA for you to download and use in your own educational platforms. So look twice for motorcycles when turning left. Um, and then uh, for the rider safety training, again, we'll be hearing from, um, from our friends in Oklahoma to explain what they've been doing as well. The motorcycle safety campaigns that are available, there are four of them, and they are available from trafficsafetymarketing.gov um, through NHTSA. There's one on getting up to speed on motorcycles, one on um, motor motorist awareness of motorcycles and rider safety, one on sharing the road, and one on stopped impaired driving. Um, all of these have different resources on their websites. There are infographics. There are videos that are available. Um, there are also Posters, some of the new um, infographics are also movable banner ads uh, so that they provide with a very short video clip that you can use. Um, a lot of social media type of um, releases that you can put out as well as documents. 
So I do want to make sure that you guys know about all of these free resources that exist as well. The Center for Disease Control has a motorcycle safety guide that's available. Federal Highway Administration has a motorcycle safety website. Um, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration has not only a website, but they also have the traffic, traffic safety fact brochures, um, which is where most of those crash statistics came from earlier. And they have the infographics that I showed in the slides that go with it. Some additional resources, again, the traffic safety marketing public awareness campaigns, um, which would be great to use um, during Motorcycle Safety Awareness Month next year in May. There is also a National Ride to Work Day um, in June that will be coming up, so these may be of use to you for that as well. There's NHTSA's Share the Road guidance document. If you go to the traffic safety marketing um, website under the Share the Road public awareness campaign, there is a guidance document that talks more about techniques for how to share the road and how to provide that awareness to both motors, motorists and riders. And lastly, the National Transportation Safety Board has a press release as well that provides additional information on motorcycle safety. One of the things I do want to point out to you, and I did put it in the chat pod earlier, um, and I did provide it as a resource in the handout do document, but it is not in the PowerPoint presentation, is a fantastic video that was created by Washington State Department of Licensing, and it's called the Second Look Video. Um, this is one of those very poignant videos uh, that I, I, I would highly recommend everyone watch. Um, it really does tell the story about looking twice for, for a motorcyclist um, and that it gets across the point, again, that for every fatality, there is a um, face that goes with that and a story and a person. Um, and so I would highly recommend taking a look at that video. And again, the link is in the chat pod and also available as a link in the, um, the handouts in the bottom, too. Okay, and again, we are going to stop um, for question and answers now, and I am going to ask you guys one more poll question, and then we will move along to our other um, speakers. If you do have any questions, please put them in the chat pod over on the left-hand side. The poll question that we have for you is countermeasures to improve safety include engineering techniques such as high friction surface treatment and road safety audits, education of motorcycle riders and motorists, enforcement of laws such as helmets, licensing, and riding sober, all of the above, none of the above, or I don't know or I don't remember. Um, and one of the questions that we have in the chat pod so far is, shouldn't the look twice graphic depict a motorcycle with its headlights on uh, so we can, so drivers can see it? And yes, that is absolutely correct. Um, and that's a good point. Thank you for, for pointing that out. Okay, and it looks like uh, everyone is correct. 97% of you said all of the above for our poll question, and that is absolutely right. And again, I, I wanted to run through all of those resources and everything very quickly and give you a, a good background on this, but I did want to make enough time to let our two presenters um, be able to, to talk to you about their case studies and what they have actually um, implemented in their home states so that you guys can have that information. So I am going to now pass our presentation over to Cliff and have him explain some of the, the best practices that they've put in place in South Dakota. Cliff? Okay, thank you, Jamie. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you clear. Thank you. Okay, very good. Just a uh, first slide here is a little bit about the South Dakota, its geographic area and the comparison to uh, the total state and the area in the Black Hills area where the uh, Sturgis Motorcycle Rally is held. And, and uh, we'll look a little bit how that makes congestion out here in western South Dakota in a little later slides. 
we're you know we're a small state we're a rural state uh, according to the 2010 census we have a population of 814,000 plus and a little, little bit, bit later you'll see how many people we think we bring in for the rally over a 10-day period we measure about 400 miles east to west uh, 200 miles uh, north to south uh, the Black Hills area there is about 40 miles east to west and uh, about 85 miles uh, north to south. So you can uh, see again what our what our congestion uh, may be when we add the number of people to our area. Uh, for uh, all the time, you know, we have some information that's available to the motorcycle riders. Uh, here's a website that. Uh, SouthDakotaWriters.com. It's an interactive mapping site. Uh, on that site, there's maps available, uh, safety tips, uh, some information about motorcycle training, uh, some information about when you're traveling South Dakota, what you expect for uh, laws and regulations and so forth. A, plot, a place for some blogs uh, for people to comment on uh, whatever they would like. And then there's a calendar of events there also. Show you a couple of screenshots on uh, some of the stuff that's available there. There's that interactive map. Uh, you'll see uh, different color codes in the roadways in the Black Hills area and out here through what I call the plains part of this part of the state. Uh, and then there's a uh, index down here from uh, easy to difficult. Uh, classification on these uh, roadways in the in this area uh, uh, easy to difficult would be is the writer's skill level that would be required to uh, uh, negotiate these roadways safely and uh, we have a uh, some of the other ones here when you travel travel South Dakota uh, it tells you about our helmet laws and South Dakota does not have a helmet law uh, for anybody over the age of 18, uh, anybody under the age of 18 is required to have a uh, helmet law. And for motorists, you'll see that this doesn't apply to bikes, but uh, seat belts are required for drivers and front seat passengers as well as any occupant under 17. Speed limits are listed there. Interstate speed limits are uh, 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 80 miles an hour on most of our interstate speeds uh, with a minimum of 40. Uh, uh, secondary roads are uh, 65 miles per hour. Some of the scenic routes in the Black Hills, they're windy, hilly areas. Uh, uh, speeds are reduced in different areas of that, uh, bridges, curves, uh, where we have and where we have limited visibility. City streets by state statute in South Dakota are automatically 25 miles per hour unless they are otherwise posted and our schools, uh, school areas are restricted down to 15 miles per hour. So that's some of the speeds relating to safety and we'll look at some of the speeds relating to the rally uh, that we uh, will, that we do, that we reduce during the rally. There's about 82,000 miles of road in South Dakota. so. Uh, uh, we have uh, our, our roads are, uh, we have a lot of miles of road per population. So we also have road condition reporting during our 511 and Safe Travel USA systems, which are updated uh, uh, on a daily basis uh, in the winter time and updated uh, also as part of, part of the incidences in the rally. So motorcycle safety courses are available. A uh, good idea when you're hitting the road to have some training of how to ride that bike and some of the things to look for it might be save, save some lives and some injuries on your bikes. Uh, we can find this on our website there under, uh, under, the, uh, travel, uh, under the travel portion, I believe it is, uh, for the uh, motor basic rider training. And uh, 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 you said 16 half an hour. 16 and a half hours of instruction. It's a combination of classroom instruction and on cycle riding, uh, straight line riding, braking, shifting, cornering, swerving are some of the things that are done in the course to see how well you can handle the bike and where you need to make some improvements. The course costs $75, and you'll uh, get a break on your uh, 
uh, written tests for your motorcycle endorsement on your driver's license, on your motorcycle driver's license. So. The Department of Public Safety also has another map out there uh, uh, in addition to the South Dakota rides map. Uh, there's a, uh, a skills level map out there that was put together by uh, some of the motorcycle clubs in South Dakota. Uh, and the level of uh, level of riding skills is in this map here. It doesn't show up to be very big, but it's based on the color-coded areas of the hills. Uh, again, you know, a lot of curves, a lot of hills, a lot of visibility issues here uh, to take the rider by surprise. So. Uh, Skills level of the uh, what a rider should uh, have to uh, take on these roads uh, in the hills area, and we have some uh, some of the more specific areas in the inset here, and also a map of uh, Rapid City, which is our largest city in the western half of South Dakota. So, uh, in the next uh, thing we want to take a look at here are some traffic control devices that we have uh, permanently mounted in, situ in certain situations, certain areas of South Dakota year-round. A radar speed uh, feedback sign which uh, indicates the, uh, in in the v speed of the vehicle as they approach a curve and the safe speed of these is based on the advisory speed for the posted curve. Uh, some uh, uh, information out of the MUTCD and South Dakota has their has a little bit of a stricter requirement on the strict uh, on advisory speed for going into a curve in one area uh, we have a sequential flashing Chevron signs uh, on a set of curves that are on uh, US 85 uh, south of the lead Deadwood area this uh, when you're southbound on this curve it uh, has a short sight distance, and uh, when you're coming into this curve, the uh, uh, vehicle speed is picked up, and if you're exceeding the uh, advisory speed for that curve, these uh, advanced warning signs and Chevron signs will flash. So something we've done uh, as part of our uh, control efforts on a, on a daily basis in South Dakota. Here's a shot of that. Uh, you can see the, what the particular uh, picture just uh, picked up the advanced curve sign and it's a uh, uh, flashing perimeter on that sign so we're uh, we think it's uh, we think it's been effective uh, we've had some reduction in crashes on that curve uh, we have done some high friction surfacing in the state uh, uh, we um, started this program a few years back. It was based on wintertime data where traffic uh, was uh, having issues on curves or other areas uh, that became uh, slick during the winter. Uh, we've, uh, it has reduced accidents on those, uh, on those areas where we have put the application down and we're currently tracking the information to see if it's a uh, this surfacing has been effective for motorcycle uh, safety or motor re or reducing motorcycle crashes. So, so we'll see what that information presents us in the future. Then we have uh, next slide here talks about permanent message signs. We've got permanent message boards in 30 locations within South Dakota. Uh, we've got 10 locations in the Department of Transportation Rapid City region, uh, this, which is uh, the western side of South Dakota, uh, where the rally occurs. Uh, some of the messages you're going to see flashing on these message boards uh, is watch for motorcycles or check your blind spot or two of the common ones. We run some others out there. Uh, and we don't run these messages continuous. We run them during a more higher traffic time of the year, spring of the year when motorcycles start to come out uh, and uh, during some of the holidays. So uh, we uh, try to uh, step up the step up the reminders uh, that there's other people or other types of vehicles on the road at those times. Talking a little bit about the volumes of traffic, uh, that comes into um, uh, South Dakota during the rally. We have a, uh, uh, 
nine sites set up uh, of traffic entering Sturgis, which is the center focal point of the rally. Uh, we run these for about uh, eight to ten days, and uh, depend. And we have a uh, traffic uh, volume that comes in on a daily basis uh, at those sites. And for 2018, well, the data shows that we brought in uh, 500,000 uh, plus motorcycles. So uh, we've had some higher number years. Uh, you know, in uh, uh, 2015, we think we brought in about uh, 747,000 motorcycles. But on an eight-year average, we're bringing in about uh, 853,000 cycles uh, into this area on an annual basis. So, you know, compared to the population of South Dakota, um, you know, being at 800 plus thousand, we get a little bit congested uh, when we confine these many people to a small state or to a small area of the state. To help with some of this congestion, we've uh, developed a Sturgis Rally Traffic Control Plan. I'll get the next slide up here. Traffic Control Plan is for the Sturgis Rally. One of the things we do, we do with the uh, cooperation of the uh, Department of Public Safety and the South Dakota Highway Patrol, we set up a traffic operations center right there in Sturgis. And from that operations center, we can uh, monitor the signal operations right there in Sturgis, uh, some of the message boards around the area, uh, and monitor a camera system that we set up at strategic locations right there in Sturgis where it gets uh, congested. And then we can monitor the safe travel uh, uh, 511 systems that are around the state that we play probably most of it attention to those in western South Dakota. And then we also update the uh, 511 information with in incidences or, crash air or crashes that might be impacting traffic uh, wherever they may be. Uh, and again, the co that concentration may be in western South Dakota. Out of the Traffic Operations Center, we also po pro provide public information uh, that can be put out to the uh, 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 radio, uh, radio stations, TV stations, whoever wants to pick it up. And then we also have direct radio communications with our state radio system, uh, Highway Patrol, and our local authorities for uh, local law enforcement and, and local uh, incident responders. So we do, uh, during the rally, we uh, have some uh, a speed control or speed limit changes. Interstate 90 is in, reduced from 75 miles per hour to 65 miles per hour uh, from Rapid City to Sturgis. That's a, usually a congested area every day. It's a 25 mile section. I did say that our, earlier that our interstate was uh, 80 miles per hour. It is in all areas except that area from Rapid City westward. Uh, to Sturgis, they reduce that. Uh, that stays at 75 miles per hour year-round, except for the rally when it do, reduces to 65. South Dakota Highway 34 is reduced from uh, 45 miles per hour to 35 miles per hour for a three-mile section on the east side of Sturgis. And South Dakota 79 is reduced from 65 to 45 miles per hour on the north side, going northward out of Sturgis for a distance of about a mile and three quarters. And then uh, we have a stop traffic advisory. We have one area that is, uh, gets congested. It's down the, in that area, in the, kind of in the southern part of the hills. Uh, it has some short sight distances. Traffic backs up coming into the little town of, of, uh, of, Steer, uh, of Keystone which is a tourist attraction in the southern hills. So we have a, uh, when, when this traffic gets heavy, we have a location where we give advanced warning that tra traffic might be backing up, uh, stopped or slowed down. Uh, uh, the message boards with vehicle detection technology monitors this and 
and transfers it to the message boards uh, along the highway. Typical message you might see on these, uh, on these boards is uh, uh, simply be prepared to stop. So we have a, uh, as part of the uh, traffic control plan for the Sturgis Rally, a roadway sweeping si uh, uh, system. Uh, we have roadway sweepers uh, located in uh, strategic uh, areas around the uh, four counties of heavily traffic uh, areas in the Black Hills area. We try to minimize the loose materials on the road. Uh, sometimes uh, if we have a rain or something, we'll get some wash onto the roadways from the sides, from the shoulders, or from some inter intersecting roadways that are gravel surface. They'll wash down into the areas of uh, the pavement. Uh, these areas can be a surprise to the rider as they come around a curve or over the top of the hill. So we try to uh, minimize these loose materials, and uh, this is also part of our South Dakota Strategic Highway Safety Plan, and we think it's uh, an effective uh, strategy for reducing motorcycle crashes to reduce that loose material on the roadway. We do... Uh, uh, some things, different things with traffic signals. We, uh, we introduce uh, seven uh, tr uh, sets of traffic signals at seven different intersections. In the summertime in the Black Hills area, because of the influx of tourist traffic, we also have uh, five intersections that are signalized that are not signalized during the off-tourist season. Uh, and we do some, during the rally, we do some traffic signal staffing. Uh, we have one location there right at Sturgis uh, is staffed for eight days during the rally. Additional uh, signal locations will be staffed if we feel the need, is ar need arises. We also have some permanent signals that are backed up by generator systems uh, uh, at seven locations. One year, a few years back, we experienced a uh, a storm that created a, a number of powder outages, and we had a number. We had uh, major problems with traffic at those intersections. Uh, these are the major, major volume intersections in that uh, rally area. So, we decided to put some generators out there, and hopefully, uh, in an effort to prevent that, we use uh, next slide. We use. Uh, uh, portable message boards and during the traffic, uh, Sturgis rally, we spread about 20 of them throughout the DOT, Rapid City region in western South Dakota, just to, uh, decor, uh, uh, just to uh, create some driver awareness uh, for the cyclists and for the motorists too in vehicles. Uh, some of the messages you might see are curves ahead, use caution. Heavy turning traffic, be prepared to stop, a watch for motorcycles, and watch for entering traffic are some of the common messages you're going to see out there. We have a list of a few more of them that we use. Speed trailers are used uh, during the rally. These things just display the uh, vehicle speed and compares that to the posted speed limit. Uh, the initial locations uh, for the rally are based on areas of concern that we had from previous years. And if that uh, area of concern turns out to be different, we can quickly uh, make changes to those locations during the rally. We have a team of people that is constantly working on our traffic control systems in the, in the rally. So with that, I'd, uh, that kind of concludes uh, what we'd have for uh, permanent uh, 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 things we do in South Dakota with regard to motorcycle safety and also some of the stepped up uh, things we do during the uh, motorcycle rally. So if you come to South Dakota, we'd like to have you ride safe. Thank you. Thanks, Cliff. At this time, um, we will take any questions you may have about what South Dakota does. Um, I'm also going to move us over to another poll break. 
So the questions that we have for you all are, which of the following are motorcycle safety best practices from the Sturgis Rally that can be applied to your area? Radar speed feedback signs, high friction surface treatment, message signs, skill rated maps, safety training for riders, all of the above, none of the above, or I don't know, I don't remember. And the second one is, which of the following are lessons learned from Sturgis Rally? Create an event traffic control plan, Speed limit reductions on some roads are effective. Roadway sweeping reduces motorcycle crashes. Temporary traffic signals assist with safety and congestion. All of the above, none of the above, or I don't know, I don't remember. Um, and Cliff, it does look like we have a question for you. The question is, can you explain the difference between seasonal and temporary signals? Yes, uh, we put up those five locations in, uh, during the tourist season uh, that uh, runs usually from about Memorial Day to past Labor Day uh, to the end of September. Uh, during that tourist season, we have those signals operating at those five locations to accommodate the heavy tourism traffic. Uh, the temporary ones are put up for the Sturgis Rally in addition to those five uh, at some locations uh, within Sturgis, within the Lee Deadwood area, which is a, a town located about 12 miles from Sturgis, further up into the mountainous portion. And then uh, uh, there's some other uh, locations that uh, uh, increase in traffic during the Sturgis Rally mostly. So and a lot of these are right around Sturgis. So. That'd be the difference. And Cliff, at this time I have ended the poll questions and I have broadcast those results if you'd like to, to address those, please. Uh, the poll questions, oh, it looks like uh, all, all of the things there in the uh, uh, safety area, all of them listed were ones that person could use and all of the, those were all of the ones that we have tried in South Dakota. And uh, the same way with the uh, lessons learned. Uh, a lot of this information that, a lot of the things we're doing are, are based on some uh, um, information we've put together of things that we feel have worked to help reduce crashes. So seems to be effective. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, and at this time, I'm going to ask Trooper Medeiros to present on the Safe Riders program. Trooper Medeiros, can, are you still connected? Dana, can you make sure that um, Trooper Medeiros is unmuted, please? Yes, I'm looking for him right now. He was. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Can you hear me now? Oh, yes, we can. Perfect. Yeah, okay, Jamie. Thank you. Uh, today, we'll be joined by uh, David Glavis with the Oklahoma Department of Transportation. He's the Assistant Chief Traffic Engineer and Acting State Highway Safety Engineer which were really important with our funding source. So if there's any of those kind of questions, he'll be addressing those. Now the Oklahoma Highway Patrol in 2012 had noticed a decrease in motor vehicle collisions in Oklahoma in all areas except the motorcycles, which seemed to be increasing. And since putting on these classes that we do, now Oklahoma has seen a decrease in motorcycle collisions. Along with engineering and enforcement, and training is really important. Okay. 
From 2012 through 2018, our Safe Riders program has held 72 classes with 1,297 students completing the course. Classes are held statewide, having gone to 27 different cities in Oklahoma all across the state. Classes are free to the public. Uh, not many riders take advantage of advanced courses due to the cost, but we do offer it as free. Riders from neighboring states are also welcome. Uh, we do not conduct classes in other states, but we do welcome them to any of our classes because a lot of them actually do come to Oklahoma to ride. Reserved classes for riders groups such as the Hog Chapters and Goldwing Clubs are also offered. Um, they'll call us and make reservations for a class. We do all these classes on Saturday. They're an eight-hour course, but we do let those guys have a course all to, their, all to themselves. Upon completing, the rider receives a certificate of completion to present to the rider's insurance company as per state statute that will give them a discount on their insurance. Uh, that being said, the state statute does not say how much that insurance discount is supposed to be. That is up to the insurance company. However, they are supposed to give them a discount. <clears throat> There are requirements for the class. They must have their own motorcycle. Uh, the rider needs to learn the skills on their own motorcycle. A motorcycle endorsement is required. So this is not an MSF class. Um, our classes are advanced skills, and the advanced skills that we teach is what we motorcycle officers uh, learn in our training courses that we take to become motorcycle officers must have a valid insurance form, full-fingered gloves, over-the-ankle boots, an approved DOT helmet, jackets or long sleeve shirt, and long pants. Oklahoma doesn't have a helmet law, but uh, in this class we do require helmets and all those other items because there is a possibility of a motorcycle going down and we do not want our riders to be injured. Uh, the course is not designed to be very difficult it is a mirror of the motorcycle course that we train on as police officers, but our cone courses are expanded a bit for the safety of our riders just to let them learn their skills. All topics are instructed with the video at our mobile classroom, which is a semi with a trailer. A trooper covers the important areas while a demonstrating trooper rides the exercise to show the proper techniques. They get a video on screen with explanations on the course that they're getting ready to ride, then an assigned uh, trooper enters a, a assigned rider, goes out and rides the course to show them the techniques and answer any questions the riders may have before starting exercises. The exercises include how to pick up a dropped motorcycle on both sides. Since there are two sides of a motorcycle, there are two different ways to, to pick up a bike. Uh, learning how to do this is in hopes to avoid any injury when somebody's trying to lift a motorcycle. Starting to stop with one foot down, we call that a clean foot, dirty foot, upon approaches to stop signs and stop lights. Uh, there is debris in the centers of the roadway, and if a person's always used to putting down that right foot and they're in that left wheel track, uh, they could put that foot down in the oil, slip, and wind up falling, and then they get to practice picking up the motorcycle. A clutch throttle control is taught as well, and this is used to control the speed of the motorcycle at slow speeds, as in parking lots, gas pumps, restaurants, where you can use your clutch to control your speed, not the, not the throttle. We have inline cone courses and an offset cone course, and this is designed to maneuver at slow speeds, as in also those parking lot situations. We do discuss a curve negotiation, and that is only an instructional only. Uh, none of the areas that we have to use, like church parking lots or any of the parking lots that are available to us, are large enough to conduct a curve negotiation. But we do have two instructors who have been through the uh, the program at in California for superbike schools, and we do have those two instructors teaching that class. Emergency braking is the number one skills that we teach. 
it's very important that everybody learns how to properly stop on a motorcycle. Too many riders that come through our class rely on rear wheel braking only, and they're just scared to use the front brakes because they just haven't been taught. So we teach this emergency braking frequently in our course, not just on the braking only, but we have other courses that we utilize the braking skills as well to try to get the riders used to using that front brake. Evasive maneuvers, when braking is not a better option, sometimes it's best to go around an obstacle if you have a way out. And so you're, the rider is always supposed to be looking down the road to see if there's any obstacles in the roadway but to make sure that there's nobody in that lane next to you when you do so. If there is, then you'll have to use emergency braking. And then we have a box turn. And all the box turn is it's a simple 24-foot area to make a U-turn. Uh, most interstate systems, roadways are 12. I don't suggest somebody making a U-turn on an interstate. But on uh, state highways, city streets, if you need to make a U-turn, you should be able to do it at least within a 24-foot area. The causations for most collisions are speed, riding, too, riding in a curve, which is going too fast into that curve, and improper braking. And all of these are covered in our class. We do have a website. It is ohpsaferiders.com. And everything in that class that I just talked about as well as videos for each of the courses can be viewed on there as well as people who want to register for upcoming classes. Depending on the size of the class, we utilize six to eight troopers to do the class. We have one lead instructor who will take care of everything logistically around the semi. And then we have one demonstration rider, and that is all he does. He, he wears his motorcycle safety gear that we wear, we wear on our department motorcycles. And he, his assignment is only to demonstrate all the exercises that we do prior to the students riding. And then we have two coaches per line, one at the beginning to start the line, and then there's one at the end who does any coaching that needs to be done at the other end. Our two lines are used for 20-person schools and three lines are used for classes of 21 to 30. We use 30 as a maximum, and we would like to use 15 as a minimum in our class sizes. Uh, there is a percentage of riders who register that don't show up, so by using the minimum of 15, we hope to at least get 10 show up on the, uh, on the smaller classes of 20. And that is all I have. And thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much, Trooper Medeiros. Um, if we have any questions, if you would put those over in the chat pod on the left-hand side right now. Um, we did have a few questions about um, additional information I put in the Safe Riders website in the chat pod. Um, and someone did ask about the presentations and whether or not they would be available. Um, everyone's presentation has been merged together in a single PDF and is available um, as a handout in the handout section down in the bottom left-hand corner. Uh, there's also a separate PDF of just the resources that are available, um, as well as the Safe Rider proposal form um, and another handout available from Oklahoma DOT as well. We have one more poll break for all of you, and then uh, we will finish up. So if anyone does have questions, again, please put those in the chat pod on the left-hand side. The question we have for you is, which of the following is not a benefit of the OHP Safe Rider program? Proven safety advantage, enhanced riding skills, insurance discounts, free safety training, or obtaining your motorcycle endorsement? Or I don't know, I don't remember. Um, and Trooper Medeiros, it looks like we do have one question for you, and that is that Hog and Goldwing riders tend to be established, have clubs, meetings, officers, and are typically made up of middle-aged and older riders. Are there any suggestions for ways we can reach younger riders? We do take the mobile classroom that you saw in that picture to other events that are not rider training events, but motor, motorcycle events, car shows. Um, 
we try to reach out to those. Well, we also have a Suzuki Hayabusa, which tends to bring in a lot of the younger riders uh, over to the trailers to talk to them about that. So really the difference in motorcycles that we have on display, uh, we do get a lot of the younger people to come in that way. That's about the only way. And Cliff, do you have any examples um, for South Dakota as to how they might reach the younger riders? Uh, I'm not sure I can add much to that. Uh, we do see a uh, we do see that most of our riders are the are the baby boomers and the uh, uh, riding the larger motorcycles. The younger riders seem to be riding the smaller more high-powered bikes. Uh, uh, we try to uh, 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 reach uh, some of the younger folks through the driver's education program, but it's a voluntary program in South Dakota uh, within our school systems. But uh, other than that, uh, we, we struggle with that. Um, and then, David, we do have a question in the chat pod about how the training program is funded in Oklahoma. Would you like to address that part of it? Uh, sure. So when it started in 2011, 2012, and 2013, those years were kind of all rolled together. They were separate um, as far as trying to fund them and the logistics, but things happened so fast that we, we, in the way the fiscal year happened, we ended up kind of funding everything all at once. We used statewide planning and research funds, and our local FHWA office was completely on board with it. Um, OHP had put together a, a, uh, a request for the department to see if we wanted to get involved and do a joint effort. I think at that time they were needing some um, equipment to get started, and, uh, and ODOT, uh, in OHP, uh, DPS, we formed this partnership. And so there are some costs that um, uh, OHP uh, assumes, but we jumped in and we bought all the equipment. Uh, I think the total for all three years was $1.2 million, which included a mobile classroom, um, a tractor to pull it around, all the equipment, the training materials, uh, even a couple of motorcyclists, motorcycles. Uh, uniforms, cones, uh, of, of that type of nature. And then once we got the program up and running, we do a $50,000 a year um, um, contribution to OHP. Again, that is SPR funds. And those are primarily dedicated to pay overtime because the troopers don't do any of this. And Brian can correct me if I'm wrong, but Troopers don't do any of this on their while they're on the clock. They they all do it on their off time, and and uh, they get overtime pay for that. But it's above and beyond their their 40 hours that they normally work traffic and and whatever other duties they have. But to kind of summarize, it was uh, state planning and research funds SPR, and um, and that's how we do it. Perfect. Um, Trooper Nears, I have now closed out the poll question and broadcast the results, so you should be able to see those. Uh, yes. Obtaining the motorcycle endorsement is the correct answer, uh, since we do not interfere with the Motorcycle Safety Foundation. But we do, as a uh, department, we like to try to get everybody to get an MSF endorsement. Um, it's not required in Oklahoma, and it's not required to have an MSF, MSF endorsement to come to our class. They just need to have an M endorsement on their driver's license. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, in closing for our webinar, we hope that you've learned to summarize motorcycle safety statistics, uh, to be able to demonstrate an understanding of motorcycle safety challenges, to identify countermeasures to improve motorcycle safety and restate the resources available, 
um, to identify best practices in South Dakota and to describe the benefits of the Oklahoma Safe Riders program. A few upcoming announcements for webinars we have coming up. Uh, in, on June 20th, we will have a webinar on rural multimodal planning. Uh, July 31st, we will have a webinar on safe systems for rural areas. We will also have an additional webinar in July that is um, current, the date is currently being determined, but it will be a webinar on the LTAP Safety Peer Exchange and we'll cover the um, topics of low-cost solution implementation with the safety circuit rider, uh, Louisiana's regional approach to safety, systemic local road safety initiatives, um, and accessible crash data. We will then also have a webinar on animal vehicle countermeasures in August. Um, as always, all of the webinars uh, from the past are accessible on our website, which is ruralsafetycenter.org, um, on the archive trainings page. The uh, upcoming ones, you can register for them on our registration page, and those will be opening soon. If you do have any additional questions about motorcycle safety, you can reach out to um, Cliff for the information from South Dakota and Trooper Medeiros for that in Oklahoma. And I do want to take the time again to thank Cliff and Trooper Medeiros for presenting today. Um, I learned some great stuff about both of your states and what you have going on, so we do appreciate you um, taking the time out of your schedule. Um, and thank you also to Dave Glavis for joining us uh, to answer questions as well from Oklahoma DOT. Sure, glad to do it. Everybody have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.